Welcome to Critical Race Conversations, a series hosted by the Folger Institute with the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I'm Owen Williams, Associate Director for Scholarly Programs at the Folger Institute. We're delighted to gather so many friends, old and new, for these conversations. I would like to take just a moment to introduce the series and our moderator for today's event. This series of free online sessions features scholars who are offering new insights into the prehistory of modern racialized thinking and racism. Our speakers are acknowledging deeper and more complex routes to enduring social challenges and conducting more inclusive investigations of our contested pasts, all with the goal of creating a more just and more inclusive academy and society. The Folger Institute is providing the framework and platform, but as is our practice, we turn to scholars across disciplines and career stages to lead discussions from their own experience and expertise. We recognize that we should allow others who are more knowledgeable about the field of critical race studies to create the conversations. We have much to learn. In these critical race conversations, we are actively experimenting with new technologies and new ways to foster dialogue and present content, just as so many of you are in your own classrooms. For this session, our speakers welcome live tweeting with the hashtag FolgerCRC and comments posted in the YouTube live chat. You may also post questions via Twitter or the live chat, and we will relay as many of these as possible to the moderator in the time we have. I remind you that this session will be recorded and posted on the Folgers YouTube channel as soon as it is processed with closed captioning enabled and a verified transcript will be uploaded next week. Please contact the Folger Institute with any questions or concerns. Today's session on race in the American South stands in for a symposium that the Institute's scholarly programs had planned to offer in partnership with the University of Alabama on early modern intersections in the American South. That program has been rescheduled for the spring of 2022 but one of its organizers will moderate today's conversation. Heather Miano Copelson is Associate Professor of History at the University of Alabama and a former Folger Fellow. She is currently writing Speaking Objects, Indigenous Women and the Materials of Dance in the Americas, 1500 to 1700. Today's conversation will introduce some of the many themes that that symposium will explore in depth next spring. These include viewing the American South through the prisms of race, enslavement and indigeneity in the centuries surrounding the arrival of Europeans and Africans to the Americas. It will ask about the particular ways that members of indigenous, European, and African cultures interacted with each other and fundamentally reshaped their respective worldviews in light of often painful realities that still resonate today. Without further ado, I give you Race in the American South. Heather, please take it away. Great, thank you very much, Owen. Uh, I am speaking to you from the University of Alabama, an institution built upon unceded Muscogean territories. The institution's occupation of this land colonizes and erases ancestral cultures and ways of knowing and being of, among others, those of the Chata peoples and the Creek Confederacy, erasure that the neighboring Porch Creek Indian Nation has been countering through education and outreach. Thank you to all involved in making this event possible, including everyone watching. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists in the order that they'll offer their initial comments, uh, and then we'll get right to it. First, we'll have Miles Greer, who's an assistant professor at the City University of New York, Queens College. Two of his notable articles include Staging the Cherokee Othello, an Imperial Economy of Indian Watching, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, and then uh, Black, White, published in Shakespeare Text. He is one of the editors of the acclaimed Early Modern Black Diaspora Studies, a critical anthology. Uh, and his book, Ink Face, Othello and the Formation of White Interpretive Community, which is forthcoming from the University of Virginia Press, analyzes how mobile, unpredictable folk methods of racial categorization preconditioned and prompted experts who enshrined a system of stable races in statutes and naturalist tables. Then we'll have Robbie Etheridge, who is Professor of Anthropology at the University of Mississippi. In addition to editing four anthologies and writing numerous articles and book chapters, she is the author of Creek Country, The Creek Indians and Their World, 1796 to 1816, and the Mooney Award-winning book, From Chicago to Chickasaw, The European Invasion and the Transformation of the Mississippian World, 1540 to 1715. She's best known for her work on the 16th and 17th century colonial disruptions in the American South and the resultant shatter zone that transformed the Southern Indians. Her current research continues this examination as she reconstructs a 700 year history of the pre-colonial Mississippi world, its transformation context, 
the restructuring of native societies that occurred as they became an instrumental part of the colonial South. Third, we'll have Liz Ellis, who is an assistant professor of history at New York University. Prior to joining NYU, she was the Barra postdoctoral fellow and a visiting assistant professor at the McNeil Center for Early American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her current book project examines the histories of the smaller native nations of the lower Mississippi Valley. Her research is broadly focused on the formation of native nations in the early Southeast and the ways that indigenous peoples shaped and limited the extent of European colonization. Liz also writes about contemporary indigenous issues and political movements. She's a citizen of the Peoria tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. All right, Miles, if you'll get us started. Thank you, Heather, for the introduction. And hello, Elizabeth and Robbie. Nice to see you both. Uh, thank you to Owen and Justine uh, and uh, Ben at the Folger for putting this together. Uh, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, greet you uh, from the land of the Matina cock. This is something I just uh, began to look into more recently. It turns out that right outside my window, uh, Northern Boulevard, a street that I walk down every day uh, in Queens, uh, was the site of a battle between the Matina cock and the Dutch. Um, not exactly outside my window, but the same uh, street. So uh, it's an education that I continue giving myself. <laughs> okay, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, my remarks today uh, are called Early Modernity as a Check on Southern Exceptionalism. The U.S. South has become exceptional in histories of race. Every American historian of race returns to the Virginia Slave Code enacted over a century from 1660 to 1750 to describe what they call a hardening of racial categories. This metaphor of hardening serves to establish the times when and the places where race is and isn't. When all the conceptual premises have been articulated and ratified, anything before this moment or outside of the US South becomes suspicious as not really race, possibly xenophobia, religious persecution, or cultural chauvinism, but certainly, certainly not race. But the social beast of race is not the same as the object of academic discipline. So what if, rather than looking at the US South as the location of racist consolidation, we treated the South as a prism through which other iterations in other uh, uh, other iterations in other times and places might become visible to us. So, for example, please share. Ah, yes, okay, and full screen. There we are. Okay. For example. What are we to make of the Virginia legislature's attempt in 1692 to prevent the proliferation of multiracial children? That is awfully small. I will read that to you. <laughs> Described as that abominable mixture and spurious issue, which hereafter may increase in this dominion as well by Negroes, mulattoes, and Indians marrying with English. It's, uh, at, the, it's at the bottom of this more visible version. The solution that they offered was a sort of racial hygiene. Quote, it is hereby enacted that for the time to come, whatsoever English or other white man or woman being free shall intermarry with a Negro, mulatto or Indian man or woman, bond or free, shall within three months after such marriage be banished and removed from this dominion forever. Colonial Virginia then is established as an unadulterated zone of white ethno reproduction. This has become the global reputation of this hemisphere, a result of the mass mediation of the abolitionist movement and of the ways that the American South became depicted uh, through the televisual aspects of the civil rights movement. However, the plantations were not the first zone 
conceived as a zone of white ethno reproduction. Consider the way Shakespeare imagined late imperial Rome in his first tragedy, Titus Andronicus of 1594. In that play, a nurse enters carrying the illegitimate child of Rome's pale Gothic empress and a black Moor who entered Rome as a prisoner of war. The nurse refers to the child as, quote, a joyless, dismal, black and sorrowful issue. Here is the babe as loathsome as a toad among the fair faced breeders of our clime. The same term issue appears in the London theater a full century before the Virginia legislators use it. In one sense, that's unsurprising since issue uh, didn't have only the sense that we have now of a print edition, uh, but did refer then to children. Uh, but it is intriguing that uh, this term actually does begin to already take on this uh, print connotation uh, when the child is black. The nurse uses the language of print to describe the child, quote, the empress sends it to thee, the moor, thy stamp, thy seal, and bids thee christen it with thy dagger's point. The child seems not a person at all, but a page imprinted by its father's inky black complexion. The same language of an indelible imprint upon the child characterizes the laws around racial inheritance in colonial Virginia. But most important, the nurse suggests that the space of Rome is a space of a particular kind of reproduction. Generation reproduction is supposed to be the making of copies of quote, fair faced breeders of our clime, our zone, our polity. Finally, Titus presages the spatial logic of ra racialized slavery and freedom. The 1691 statute decrees that any Negro freed must be sent out of the country within six months. Moreover, it calls for the banishment of whatsoever English or other white man or woman being free shall intermarry with a Negro, uh, that they will be banished after three months forever. The dream of this space of endless white reproduction is of course not attainable. There cannot be empire and a monoracial polity. There cannot be militarized manliness and conquest without encouraging the displays of power that include the taking of conquered women, forcing them to become breeders for the conquerors. The hope then is to ignore, to outlaw, to banish, so as to maintain at least the fantasy that imperial projects of racial dominance uh, actually contradict and undermine even as they succeed. There is no legitimacy for non-white children. By definition, they must be adulterated, impure, unchosen. And white adults who partner with non-white others fall out of whiteness. Again, this too was predicted in Titus. Tamara is described as in amorous fetters to Aaron, that is enslaved to Aaron, though both he and his child as black are also constantly referred to as slaves. Uh, and this is interesting for the child since uh, his mother, of course, uh, is white and the empress of Rome. Tamara is already a captive in exile, but she is killed at the end of the play uh, like a Gothic prostitute. Titus does not venerate her as a native born Roman queen. He kills her with as much impunity uh, as he killed Forgive me, there is an error here. Oh, no, her white son. I was thinking, she doesn't hear. <laughs> Aaron's son doesn't die, right. Her white son, <laughs> who is a war captive who has not married into the Roman aristocracy. Uh, there's no way to banish someone from this zone of white reproduction than to kill them. That is a permanent dispatch. So before we think of the South as this exceptional location of racism in the history of the world, it is important to think about how this place and whatever was achieved there was being dreamed up for centuries. Virginia would appear to be one of the locations in which the English tried out what they'd been experimenting with in their heads, on paper, and on stage. 
Uh, and I just want to give one final example of that. Uh, some of you will be familiar with Thomas Harriet's brief and true report on the Newfoundland of Virginia, uh, 1588. Uh, and I wanted to point out this map uh, of the arrival of the English. Uh, you'll see the ships here. Uh, and I'm not certain if you can see, uh, there are little small images of native people at different moments, but uh, there are more ships than there are native people. So uh, it gives the impression uh, that the land has sort of already been cleared uh, to be this white uh, ethno space. <clears throat> and I, I want to add that even rhetorically, uh, Harriet's report, uh, as, as many scholars have pointed out, uh, it begins with the commodities that are for sale in this new land. Uh, it's only in the final section that you get any sense that there are people already living there. Um, and then they are depicted as peaceful, uh, as sparse, and also as eager for conversion. So it's this sort of interesting tension between um, there aren't that many of them, they're ready to be converted. But by the way, before we go, let me give you a report on the defenses that their towns have and their weapons. Like, well, why would you even need to talk about that unless, of course, you do uh, expect resistance? So this is part of what I mean about, you know, as early as 1588. Uh, the kind of dreams of a possible uh, space for uh, white profit, uh, white conquest, and white reproduction uh, are already ready. And I think looking through the prism of the South uh, allows us to actually see England itself uh, as a racialized space. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm up next. Um, and I um, would also like to extend my thanks to Heather and the folks at the Folger for putting this together. This has really been a been a fun uh, a fun project. Um, and like Miles, I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, that the indigenous lands I'm, from where I'm coming from. I'm in uh, Oxford, Mississippi. These are the uh, the uh, former lands of the Chickasaw Indians. Um, when I think of race in the early modern South, I don't think in terms of European racial categories and prejudices and uh, ideologies, uh, because I'm trying to come at this from a native perspective. And um, so I don't think in terms of white, black, native, and so on. Rather, I try to think about how native people understood others. You know, you know they certainly, recognized outsiders from their own groups and people who were not of them. Um, and they definitely had strong ideas and opinions about the character of those others. Uh, but they did not think in terms of the racial categories with which Europeans thought. Um, their definitions of who belonged were rooted in things like kinship, township, polities, and, and other, you know, and things like that, right? not, and not skin color, religion, or places of origin. Um, having said that, though, there's no doubt that Native people in the early modern South came up against the ideologies of Europeans and the consequent prejudices and discriminations that accompanied those. Um, and this is an intersection that really interests me. How did Europeans conceive of Native people? at the time, and how did these, this conception shape those interactions between the natives and the newcomers? And I think Miles was getting at some of that with his earlier comments. Um, and in addition, as historians such as Christina Snyder and Taya Miles and others have shown, um, some segments of native societies by the 19th century had adopted European racial categories along with the prejudices and discriminations that came with those categorizations. They began having, you know, adopting, um, having but owning uh, African slaves and so on. And um, so, you know, e even though you can say Native peoples did not, you know, carry that, carry those racial categories with them until into the 19th century, they still came up against them and they had to deal with them in, in many, in many varied ways. Um, I also want to talk just a little bit about 
the conception of um, you know the, the, the American South. How do we think about that? And again, from my point of view, it my conception of the American South does not conform to the general thinking about the South as a region. Uh, obviously, the idea of the South is not an indigenous one, but it's rather an imported Euro-American one. Um, however, you can still see some regional coherency even in pre-colonial times. And Liz, if I could have that slide of the Mississippi and Moral. So this map is a map of the Mississippi world as um, was, was at the time of, it's around 1540 at the time of the Hernando de Soto um, expedition. And the line you see here, this is actually the path of Hernando de Soto. And um, I tried to map out this Mississippi world based on the de Soto documents and also very much on the archeology. span So you can see there's many places that Soto did not go right, but that we still know about in the archaeological context. Um, and as you can see from this map, this, this, um, this pretty, it's pretty much the Mississippian world in 1540. By Mississippian, I mean the, um, that's the term that the archaeologists get to this pre-colonial era that dates from about 900 AD to about 1600 AD. Um, and this world was, uh, like it showed some regional coherency um, and actually largely conforms to what we think of as the American South. I should mention that in earlier times, before 1540, there were Mississippian polities up into the, uh, up the, up the, up the Mississippi Valley. But um, in 1540, this was pretty much the Mississippian world. But this regional coherency derives from an environmental fact, and that is that uh, corn agriculture underwrote these um, polities, and corn agriculture required specific climatic and environmental factors that more or less were found only in the American South and parts of the Midwest. When I say corn agriculture, clearly other people across the Americas grew corn, but in the Mississippian world, these were hierarchical large communities and, and uh, polities that depended on intensive corn agriculture. And to grow as much corn as they needed to uh, sustain these policies, that could only really be done in the American South in parts of the Midwest. So basically, and kind of roughly speaking, one does not found, find the Mississippi mound builders north of uh, present day Virginia and Kentucky. So it's not an exact overlay, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, now, having said that, again, even though Native peoples did not conceive of the of a, of a South as, as we, we're talking about it today. Um, the Euro-American political, social, and economic traits that came to define the American South clearly had an impact on indigenous life. Um, and this includes things like the importation of Africans into race-based slavery, the plantation system, the economic caste system, and the power of Southern elites the sexual divide between the North and the South, and certainly the beginnings of the cotton boom and su subsequent land grab of the 19th century, which led to Indian removal. So if I could get that next slide, Liz. So what you see here is the American South in 1700. And as you can see, it is, it is transformed. All of those policies that existed in the pre-colonial Mississippian world are now gone. And they've been replaced by, I mean, people didn't disappear. But what happened is the people re restructured their lives, restructured, restructured their policies, restructured much about their political life and economic life to live in this expanding European world. Um, and this is when you got the formation of the more better known Southern Indian groups, such as the Choctaws, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, and so on. Those groups didn't, the Southern did not encounter those groups. Those groups formed um in the crucible of colonization um and so you know although many people of the south do not think in terms of southern their lives were impacted by the emergence of this american south
Okay, great. Um, thanks so much. Um, I'm really excited to join you all here this afternoon as well. And thanks for setting me up so well, um, Miles and Ravi. I'm joining y'all from um, Lenape Homelands where it's currently finally stopping snowing a little bit. Um, and I do wish we could be in person, but I'm very grateful to Owen and Justine um, and all the folks at the Folger Institute for having me. And thanks Heather for facilitating this conversation. Um, so I'm a historian who works on the 17th and 18th century Southeast and specifically, um, I'm now finishing up a book on the lower Mississippi Valley. So the region that's currently Mississippi, Louisiana and Eastern Texas. Um, and my work focuses on smaller native nations in this region. So as Robbie, you know, sort of showed you in that, um, that first uh, map, there are some larger sort of cultural groups. And then we looked at that second map um, and I will pull this back up um, and, uh, and show you the, the smaller region that I'm talking about. But um, my work specifically focuses on smaller indigenous polities in the region. Let me start this again. Okay, so if you can see down um, in the lower Mississippi Valley, groups that are labeled as Biloxis, Bayagulas, Chawashas, Tensas, those sort of groups. Um, and I'm primarily interested in my work in the process of indigenous nation building. So how and why some of these nations chose to remain as smaller groups, what that means for how people think about belonging to a nation, about who constitutes them and about how these different nations exercise power. I keep saying smaller groups. Um, that's because in the late 17th and the early 18th century, much of the native nations who inhabited this Gulf South region were smaller in size. So I'm talking about 200 people to 3,500 people as a region. Um, so all in all in this lower Mississippi Valley region, there's about, there's a little less than 20,000 um, people who belong to these smaller groups at the turn of the 18th century. And I tell you this because one of the things that I think is really important to understand when we think about the early South and when we imagine in particular the French empire and the Spanish empires in the South is that there's just not as many European settlers as I sometimes think we like to imagine. So at the height of French empire, Louisiana, lower Louisiana, only contains 4,000 French settlers um, or European settlers. This is a super small number of people to be claiming this huge region. Um, and the reason that I, I talk about this and I, I'm thinking about power and you know, the limits of empire and the demographic makeup of the South is I think it's really important to remember that when we think and talk about the early modern South and the ideologies and sort of intellectual currents um, of the people of this place, most of the South is comprised of native people at this point. And so it's really important to think as, you know, Robbie has gestured at, um, as Miles is talking about the, not just the, the currents of European racial thought that are in process of formation during the 17th and 18th century, but also indigenous framings of who belongs, who's excluded and how to think about physical and social difference. So I wanted to open this conversation by um, making kind of two points. The first of which to um, echo Robbie um, is to sort of say that race is not the primary way that native people think and talk about difference or about belonging in their societies. And this remains true until the end of the 18th century in most cases. So native people have diverse and concrete ways of thinking about who belonged and who was part of their families, their wider kinship networks and their nations. Um, Many native Southerners, uh, like people who would become Cherokees, Choctaws, and Creek or the Muscogees during this time period, trace descent uh, through matrilineal networks. So basically um, by the mother instead of by the father as is more common in European societies at this time period. Um, and what this means, for example, if there was a woman within the Creek nation who had a child with someone who was not Creek, and this could be someone who was Choctaw or this could be someone who was English, that child would be regarded as belonging to and part of the Creek nation. There's actually a really cool example of just this phenomenon working um, in the era of the American Revolution for this Creek leader named Alexander McGillivray. 
So his mother is from the influential Wind clan within Creek society. His dad is Scottish and he's regarded as belonging fully to Creeks. So that while um, and he, he becomes super powerful in part because he's accepted in both societies, right? The patrilineal descent lets him make inroads with the English, the matrilineal kinship networks, let him exercise a power and authority within Creek um, nation. And so while English outsiders, English diplomats write about him as a half breed, People within his own nation would not use this kind of Harry Potter-esque languages of mixed bloods or you know, partial makeups to talk about his ways of belonging. He was simply Muskogee, right? He was, it's more important that he is from the town of Kushada, for example, than that he you know, had a father who was not from immediately within this nation. Um, and so I wanna just show you a couple of images to think as well a little bit about physical, how native people um, used physical difference to mark insiders and outsiders. Um, before I return to some, some more of this. Um, so I wanna look at a couple of images of physical difference here. Um, these are from a variety of time periods and actually uh, Miles set me up perfectly by referencing um, Harriet before this. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of images that I want you to kind of look at the, um, what, what stands out to you about how these native people look different. They're all different time periods, all different parts of the South. The point here is to emphasize the physical appearance of diversity among native people um, in this region. So this first image is from 1590. Um, it's near, you know, uh, it, what's now North Carolina. Um, it's a, and it, this is actually an image that's from an engraving done by Theodore de Bry, but based on the observations of John White, who was an Englishman who traveled to Roanoke in the 1580s. I'm using a German pr colorized print of this because it was clear and high resolution, but I think what's important is to notice the amount of body paint, the unique hairstyles um, in this, this uh, image. This second image, um, I actually, despite it looking perhaps like a grade school drawing, this was done by a French engineer in the early 18th century. This is a man who was traveling um, through Natchez, which um, you can actually see one of these mounds, which is a holdover from Mississippian cultural practices in the middle. These are women of different social classes within Natchez. You can see them marked by tattooing, um, by distinct forms of dress and hairstyle. Um, this third image uh, is not unattributed. It's from the 1740s in Northwestern Louisiana. It's probably of a Caddo man. Again, you can see how different the hairstyles and the body paint is here, the markings, the clothing. And finally, and I'll tell you why I'm, I'm moving so quickly through these in just a minute. The final image I wanted to show you, similar time period, again, early 18th century. This is from um, 1736, and this is actually by a um, baron from Hanover who ends up traveling to Georgia during this time period. And he visits with uh, Yuchi people who are affiliated with the Creek Nation. And you can see that he's really struck in his depiction, both by this hairstyle, you can see the cropped bit of hair at the top of this man's head, as well as the extensive tattooing, paint and clothing as, are the things that he's highlighting with his use of color um, in these images. Okay. So what I wanna say really quickly about why I'm focusing on these you know, physical differences in the way that many people are presenting themselves with their dress, with their hairstyle, with all of their other um, sort of personal choices is that native Southerners had perhaps very, well, certainly very distinct from European ideas about adoption and the ability of outsiders to belong to native societies. So what I mean is that native people often believed, and this is not true in all cases, not everyone can become part of a native society, but that outsiders who either married into other native nations, who migrated to become part of native nations, or who were captured and integrated as, adop as um, uh, adopted, um, could become fully part of those societies, regardless of their original ethnic origin, the languages they spoke originally, or sort of their upbringings. Um, and this is, this is really important. Uh, anthropologists and historians sometimes call this fictive kinship or the building of outsiders into parts of society. Um, and this is, this is a helpful way to translate this, but it also kind of doesn't make a lot of sense within an indigenous worldview. It'd be a bit like if I adopted a child and proceeded for the rest of my life to call him my fictive son, it would just sound a little weird to most people. Um, Native people really did believe in the ability to take outsiders and to make them kin and make them part of their society. 
and the ability to transform people's dress and physical uh, body paint hairstyles to make them present as part of the nation is part of this process of transforming outsiders into people that belong, alongside, of course, learning to speak other languages, learning different kinds of customs. Um, and so I'm dwelling on this because this kind of is it fairly fundamental odds with the very rigid ways we come to think about race and identity in the South in the 19th century to again gesture to this fluidity um, and to the little bit of flexibility, basically that race has to be made. It doesn't come out as this hard um, thing, you know, in the 17th and the 18th century. And actually, uh, this is maybe an, an aside, but I think one of the really beautiful things about the malleability of the system is that it also lets people who are gender non-conforming, who we might think of as two-spirit, so that's a global term for queer indigenous today, or people who are non-binary, to remake them and refashion themselves into identities that fit within the nation. So basically, there's a lot of flex within these southeastern indigenous systems of belonging. And again, I'm talking really broadly here as a way to make sense of all of these super different and diverse societies that I just highlighted, but there are more sort of similarities through here um, across native nations. Okay, so because this is all about relationships, um, native people would not have been able to make sense at all of the phenomenon of spitting into a tube to determine if they're native Americans, you know, to do a run through a 23 and Me test as we might today. Um, they wouldn't even really have been able to think in terms of skin color as the defining factor in the 17th and the early 18th century. This is something that has to be learned. So this, this brings me to my second point and I'll finish up here, which is that um, none of the diverse peoples of the South would have conceived of themselves as Indians. Um, again, at least until the latter part of the 18th century. This is a racial term that has to be made through the process of colonization, slavery and settler ideologies. Um, again, European slavery is its practice in the Southeast, and here I mean the enslavement of both indigenous and African peoples within the South is, creed, is key to creating these Southern notions of race. And so coupled with this, European ideologies that lumped various native nations together as Indios, Salvage, Indian, or other terms, work in tandem with native people's own mobilizations increasingly of race and the language of redness. Um, and here I'm thinking of George Mill and Nancy Shoemaker's work on the creation of native ideas about race um, to create indigenous notions of native identity as a unified category. So this is all this to say that we, I think we really need to historicize the way we think about race in the early modern South and to pause and remember that race was not primarily how native people define themselves as belonging. All right, well, thank you very much for the three of you. Um, we There are some questions that I've been thinking about, but first I wanted to give the three of you a chance to respond to each other, if you'd like to do that. Well, I'm burning with a question if neither of my colleagues, I mean, I had the longest time to think. So um, as I was listening to uh, both of you, I was sort of thinking, um, two things. One, is it possible for us to get away from an intellectual history of race, right? As in, what were people thinking, right? And maybe get to a more material history of what do people do with race? Um, and what I'm thinking, especially after Liz's presentation, um, is I do think of race as being about kinship and belonging. Um, European race, right? And I'm wondering, for example, if the reason that European race has to be more um, impermeable, right? You know, less, um, yeah, less permeable, le less, less, um, more restrictive, um, has something to do with economic systems. Right, you know, so it's like, well, if I have a system that's based, if I have an economic system that's based on private property and I want my property to go to my legitimate heir, then I have to have a system that says, you can't be the legitimate heir, right? Um, but they're both still about kinship and belonging. You know, um, so, it, so for me at least, whether the language of race is used or the idea of race is in place is not as crucial to me 
as like the fact that both of these are about both of these do the same work. Um, so I don't know. It's just what I was it, what I was sort of starting to think as I as I listened to the both of you um, is is there I guess there's sort of two questions. One is is European capitalism one of the reasons that you know and the, the European conception of property one of the reasons for this difference in um, the permeability of kinship one um, and then two um, is our historical imagination maybe impeded by looking for like when a fully color-based biological idea of race comes into play. Do you know what I mean? Like, is, is, is that really what we, what we want to know? Sorry, the question was a little long, but that's the question. <laughs> Liz, you want to tackle that first? Nice. I like that approach, Robbie. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> No, Miles, I mean, I think you I think you raise a couple of really important things, the first of which is that, as we right, all hopefully increasingly know, race is not just about your skin color, right? It's about all these other constructions and exclusions and other kinds of processes. And, um, you know, I think your your question gets at some of the, the messiness of this early period, because I think specifically for indigenous people, there's a lot of fighting, I mean, at least within sort of French administrative apparatus about what to do with native women who have been enslaved, taken, made part of French families, should they be able, like you're saying, to inherit property? In some cases, yes. In some cases, they're specifically excluded in different parts of the French empire. In some cases, they vanish. You can see it in the archival record where they're first listed as an Indian slave, and then they're listed as marrying this man and they become wife. And then their children are only listed as French or settlers, right? So there's, there's different kinds of erasures, forcible inclusions, forcible exclusions. Um, within within this process, and certainly early um, uh, French and uh, sort of uh, settlers, and I guess I hate to call them explorers, but people stomping through indigenous homelands in the south, right, and don't and sometimes describe native people as having fairer skin or darker skin or looking and presenting in different ways. Um, they're actually very fixated on, you know, are these people Christian? Are they not Christian? Which I think is common across the Southeast. But to your question about European capitalism, I do think that um, the creation of Indian in particular, and which will in the 19th century become more conflated with these, these concrete ideas of race, um, really emerges out of the creation of this system of slavery. And so to be able to enslave someone um, you have to think about them as part of this, this larger group of barbarians as opposed to people of individual nations who your own nation may or may not have a relationship with. So certainly, I mean, I think that this, this it, it would be wonderful to have more of these conversations in sort of in the same vein as this, this growing scholarship on racial capitalism, right? In, in the, the larger American context. But yeah, I think that this is, I think, I think you're exactly right. And I think that both of these these are really important facets. Robbie, do you, if you want to? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, when I think about all this, it, you know, everybody around the world has different ways of categorizing who belongs and who doesn't belong. And um, it shouldn't you know, be a surprise that Europeans have a different you know, system than we do. And kinship always figures into this. But one thing that strikes me about the European perception is that it becomes coupled with the doctrine of white supremacy. Now, Indian people, trust me, the Cherokee, eight, you know, 17th century Cherokee woman or man thought they were the, they were human, everybody else was not. So, you know, this, this kind of idea of ethnic supremacy was, again, not an unusual thing. But what, to me, what happens is that, is that, that European conceptions of race, which is coupled with white supremacy, becomes, it gets, it becomes powerful through capitalism and through the, you know, the, the nascent capitalism that starts in Europe, right? And, and then, of course, then it's, um, you know, uh, uh, instantiated or operationalized through colonialism. Um, and so, you know, those two things going hand in hand, to me, it, you know, there, there's probably something there about how capitalism 
and white supremacy develop together, you know, and then into the, and then once that, then you have to have these hardened racial categories in order to maintain that power structure that accompanies capitalism. Those are just some thoughts on that. Um, and, you know, one thing, Miles, I think that your work is, is telling us, especially, is that when Europeans got here, they didn't come with these full blown, you know, hardened racial categories. That, that takes a couple hundred years to develop, right? As capitalism develops, as those power structures get, get hardened and, and, you know, in place so that, you know, Europeans have the economic power. They are the ones, they control the economic power, let's face it. You know, Indian people are a part of that and definitely instrumental in that during the deerskin trade and even, even the Indian slave trade. But at some point they lose that edge. You know, they're no longer become instrumental to the, I, you know, they're, I they're would just, long, right, of commodities, the commodity becomes land and then they're, you know, they're not, that, they're not useful to the machine and machine at that point. I, I would just add a little, I, I think that um, the, the fluid, hard um, dichotomy um, potentially gets us in a, a trap. Um, so I think what actually um, white supremacy is, um, is I get to decide as a white person when, you're, when it's fluid, when it's changeable, <laughs> and when it isn't. You know, and I think that, that, main, that maintaining that ability to turn it on and off um, is actually the key um, and not sort of, oh, when it's fluid, it's okay. Um, you know, that's sort of the French version. We're not racist because we believe everyone can become French, right? <laughs> it's like, why would everyone want to become French? You know, <laughs> but like that, that's their version of egalitarianism, right? Um, and they don't seem to get, right, that that's a kind of, that that was, that was actually the tool of their imperialism you know, was cultural assimilation. And so, yes, it's fluid and flexible and anyone can become French, um, but it was actually still racist and exploitative. Um, so I like to think that it's, that race, uh, that white supremacy, to use your term, always has to keep both options open because it needs, it needs both. Yeah, I think. Robbie or Liz, did you want to pose any, any questions or, or direct comments? Okay. I think we have a vote for the Q&A. All right. Sounds good. I mean, I have another question, but I will defer to our, our you know, to the, to the fans. <laughs> Well, maybe you can you can do the thing where you work in the question as you're answering something else. <laughs> all right. Well, so you've all been talking in in different ways about these different conceptions of uh, about conceptions of human difference among natives, among Europeans, um, and how they interact, um, how they affect each other. And so I was wondering if if maybe you could speak a little more directly, perhaps especially Miles, if um, you have ideas about, you know, how, for instance, Black Africans had their conceptions of human difference changed in return in these exchanges with European, interactions with Europeans and, and natives. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that, Heather. I thought, where's this question going? Uh-oh, <laughs> I'm not ready to answer that. Um, yeah, I, you know, I actually, at, at, as you know, I'm not an Africanist. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not as certain about that. Um, but it's a question that I want to know, you know, um, I, m my hypothesis would be that um, in the same way that I was sort of saying, if you've got this conception of private property, and that I've and it's got to go to my, my first son, you know, and, uh, you know, then those kinds of um, anxieties produce a system that will regulate it. So, I mean, my guess would be that perhaps um, African uh, aristocracy might have had a firmer, <laughs> um, you know, ha might have had something that that parallels or se that might seem racialized to us. Um, but yeah, I I I don't know. I I, I want to know more. 
Well, and also if we're talking about the importance of economic power, right, that's going mm -hmm. to make a difference in, in who gets to who gets to influence other people with um, notions of, of anything. Um, Liz or Robbie, did you want to um, say anything? I would say that because we do know a little bit about at least, you know, Native South, Native Southerners, how they may have, how those perceptions may have changed. It's, it's important to remember that, you know, Lynn points out the fluidity of these categories, but if you are a member of a group, it's very exclusionary, right? And I mean, they could, you could be fully adopted as a member of that group and you become full-fledged citizen of that group. However, if you're not a citizen of that group, right, then there was, you know, a lot of animosities and hostilities towards you. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a friendly place where everybody was getting along. And those distinctions in hair and, and tattoos, those are vitally important because if you had someone on the trail and, you know, you would know who they were by their hairstyle, right? Um, you know, a lot of these folks were multilingual, so it wasn't even a matter of did they speak your language or not. It was it was things like these visual cues, like hairstyle and tattooing, and whatnot. language of course played into it. So these were these were at least I'm talking about the very early period. You know, now we do move with a transformation. You know, from these Mississippian polities into the colonial world, we do get these coalescent societies, which are made up of a variety of people, right? Uh, coming together, uh, not so much for Liz's group that she's studying down the Gulf Coast, but these, like the Cherokees and the Creeks and so forth. Um, and one of the big questions that, that we have to, that we haven't able, been able to answer just yet is what drew those people together, given the animosities, uh, animosities that existed in the pre-colonial world, what drew them together and what was the glue that held them together? Because even in these coalescent societies, they still understood themselves to be separate, like for the Creeks, um, Liz mentioned, you know, the Gilderay, he was more, you know, his, his main loyalty was to his town of Cushada. That's, you know, was the case. It, everybody still had their identities tied to, in this, in this, in this case, the specific towns in the colonial period, right? And so we don't really understand what the glue was that held them together despite these differences, right? So. I think um, to kind of take this in a, or to build on these and take it in a, a different direction, I think one of the things that really happens by the beginning of the 19th century is Native people begin to really do this, this category of Indi either Indian or thinking of themselves as red men does become something that's meaningful and not just from the outside as a thing of exclusion, but as a way of thinking about and sometimes providing the language for multinational native um, organizing resistance movements, things like Pontiacs, um, the war called Pontiacs. Um, but I think there, there are some traces of native people um, adopting, using, and articulating these ideas about sameness, um, sometimes based on language of red, which as Nancy Shoemaker points out, does not necessarily mean skin color because red had very, I mean, Robbie's actually the expert on this, but red had like significant ceremonial um, meanings and you know connotations um, within Southeastern indigenous societies. But that in the, there are a couple of examples from the lower Mississippi Valley in the 1720s where both Natchez people and Tensa people draw on this language of redness to unify their polities. I mean, to Robbie's point about, you know, what holds people together, which looks like something new. It looks like something that didn't exist even 20 years before that point, but as Native people are thinking strategically about how do we resist colonialism? How do we push back against this settler influence? They take some of the tools, some of the ideas, and they formulate new ideologies. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind and that maybe helps, you know, give some of the context for why we're seeing these terrible fights today within Indian country, within tribal communities over what to do about um, Black um, members of nations, right? And so I'm thinking here of Cherokee Freedmen, I'm thinking here of people who are, have historically been excluded because of the currently existing racism um, within many Native nations, including my own. I don't mean to call out Cherokees here, but... Um, it, I think that a lot of that comes into play in the early 19th century as both the U.S. federal government fixes Indian policy more um, 
aggressively to be exclusionary and to ha include these ideas about savagery, race, civilization, and as um, blackness and anti-blackness really in the South and the sort of expansion of what we think of as becoming that, you know, iconic 19th century plantation slavery moves into native homelands. You see things like within the Cherokee constitution um, in the early, I think it's 1827, I hope, um, where uh, Cherokee people begin to explicitly exclude um, people of African descent from becoming full citizens and holding positions of power within the Cherokee nation, right? And this represents a change. And so as Robbie's saying, there are ways that native societies are super exclusive and that people think about who gets to come in and who is definitely not part of the people. And increasingly in the 19th century, the language of race is applied both externally from the US federal government and then internally as native people try and use these settler ideologies to make their ways of belonging legible to the outside state. This is all to say this stuff did not or originally exist as sort of racial categories and there, there's this complicated process and a lot of it will have to, the way we think it anyway today about you know, indigenous people and what constitutes someone who is able to be enrolled um, within uh, the, the native nation has a lot to do with this process of forming race and these logics of exclusion um, that get us to where, where we are today. But it's, it's, a, it's a long process, as I think we're all saying. Heather, if I could add just one little note. The, the one thing that came to me uh, as I was listening, and it's so interesting to me, this, the parallel sometimes between um, transshipped Africans. And so what I, what I heard from Liz and Robbie was sort of a move from ethnic affiliation, you know, my tribe, my town, my, right, um, to a kind of pan-ethnic um, identity that's really strategic to resist this force. And, you know, historians like Michael Gomez, uh, you know, have talked about that among diasporic Africans, you know, a move from I'm Igbo, you're Fula, you know, to like, we're all black now. You know? <laughs> um, and, and that's sort of what I was hearing uh, from you all. Um, and I think also the sort of fascinating um, Black Native alliances uh, that occurred, especially in the Caribbean, you know, maroon communities. Um, so it definitely seems that um, as I continue learning more about it, I'll be interested in um, those, you know, whether part of the reason for some of these affiliations um, was both strategic, um, and I mean Black Native affiliations, um, but also that maybe they had similar systems of kinship to begin with. And that's why it was a little bit easier uh, sometimes uh, for these um, multiracial mar maroon communities to emerge. Um, you know, most famously the moment when Dessaline, right, announces the founding of Haiti and the big mystery that historians always, you know, ask is how does he know the Arawak name for this island? You know, and why does he choose that? when he declares the founding of a Black Republic. So like those are the mysteries and those are the interesting things to me. I do just want to um, jump in and say, yeah, I, I did, I think you're right about this, like, you know, move towards Indian and indigeneity as a thing that's meaningful, though no one would have used the word indigeneity in the really any time before the past, like maybe two decades. Um, but there is, I think still, if you asked a native person in the mid 19th century and the early 20th century, like, identify yourself. I mean, to Robbie's point, it's remarkable the endurance of these town and individual clan um, level affiliations and the way that people present themselves as those are the most meaningful. I think most people would still first identify them. This is true today by their own nation and then secondarily. But yeah, it, it, it's not one or the other, right? We're, we're layering these ways of identifying in this um, settler colonial society. All right. Uh, well, this question is takes up some of these. Well, actually, a lot of these points about um, categories of difference and how flexible or not they are. Uh, and so, if there are these, you know, they, there are ways for outsiders to become citizens of a group. And then, as Robbie said, you know, but that's also very exclusionary of everybody who's not in that group. Um, could either Robbie or Liz talk more about our, in this area, do we have native peoples who have um, permanent hierarchies and, and permanent underclasses? So we, we've both mentioned uh, the practice of 
enslavement of native peoples as well as of Africans. Uh, but in terms of you know, these native conceptions of difference, are the societies ones in which there are these um, permanent underclasses? I'll, I'll stick to that first and then I'll let Liz pick it up. Um, just chronologically, because I don't, you know, step in or step in chronologically. But the early period, you know, when Hernando de Soto comes through and he sees this Mississippian, a fully functioning Mississippian world, um, yeah, those are, those are what archaeologists call them chiefdoms. That's an archaeological term for a specific kind of polity. And there's basically Two ranks of people. There's the elite class, at, not class, there's the elites at lineages and the non-elite lineages. And they were, they did maintain a lot of distance socially, uh, economically, and so on. And these the elites, the elites are the ones who uh, lived on top of the mounds, basically. And they, they had, um, these chiefs varied in how much control the elites had. You know, some of them were highly centralized, and some of them were more uh, what they call hierarchies, right? Where you had the, the, the power was more dis, dis, diffused amongst the uh, amongst the lineages. But um, so in the when the photo comes through, yes, very much you know rank societies, and you were born into those lineages. These were you know uh, ascribed ascribed statuses. And no, you could not move from one uh, ostensibly from one group to another. However, having said that, though, the um, there during transitions, uh, say when one chief or chieftainess died and another one, you know, was, was coming up, there was a lot of um, ambiguity in who was next in line, and that is in part because these lineages, uh, they were mat well, we think they were matrilineal, um, but they did, you know, you could trace back several generations, so there was always contenders to the, the so-called throne, right? Um, so, but you still had to be in that elite, that elite group, elite lineages. Um, that changes though, we see that change dramatically with, with uh, when Europeans get here. And um, the archeology span tells us that, um, you know, that uh, prestige goods and uh, like say guns and, European bees and whatnot start being found everywhere, right? With everybody and not just with the elites. So that tells us that that hierarchical organization declined. What replaces it? We've always said egalitarian systems that replaced it. Um, my own suspicions is that's not quite right because we do see certain plans like the wind plan the Creeks, for example, you know, ha have more prestige and, and they seem to take the leadership roles even in historic times. But there is, it's definitely not the same as it was when Soto saw, right? Those chiefs that Soto saw were being carried around on, on litters and they were considered divine, they were considered gods. Um, we don't, you know, McGillivray was never a god. No one ever thought of him as a god or even, you know, even related to the gods. He had no special communication with the gods. He was, you know, he was a man who rose to power through his influence and, you know, decision-making. So, um, anyway, does that answer your question? So there's a, there's a transition, right, between the Mississippian world and the colonial world. And in Liz's case, I mean, she deals with those you know, the smaller groups down on the coast, and those were those were you probably have a better sense of how those were organized politically than we do these large coalescent societies. Where talk to you there, yeah, yeah. Um, the I mean, I think to sort of build on what Robbie's saying, the, the answer is in part that this is a little all over the place because, again, native nations are so diverse um, in their social organization and their political theories. Um, we, even in, within the smaller groups, um, the smaller nations that I focus on in the lower Mississippi Valley, some of these are much more hierarchical where they talk about having elite rulers who are continuing these um, traditions of using or monumental earthworks um, in their, their sort of presentation of status. Um, there are others that are very egalitarian. There's 
I think the one thing that's true across the board is that captives are very, if they're integrated into society, they're very often occupy the very lowest social rungs. And so you can be living with the people, but also fundamentally excluded from belonging in society. I think one of the things that's important here, though, is that unlike later articulations of, um, you know, fundamentally U.S. slavery, the children of people born of captives within these societies typically are not treated as outsiders. They become, they're able to become within a generation parts of these societies. This obviously is not the same as having full autonomy and freedom. These relationships can be deeply coercive, but there's, there's a different kind of way in which people are excluded and then perhaps forcibly included. That being said, I mean, there are some really great accounts of um, sort of early French travelers interacting with, I'm thinking of one of um, where a bunch of French folks are coming down the river and they're greeted by a Bayagula diplomat who's missing half his scalp. So this is someone who was captured, taken, brought into the Bayagulas as an outsider and who has now come to serve a position as a diplomatic emissary for that nation and is the person responsible for building these external relationships. So there's some flex. I think the, the final thing I'll say to answer this question is where I can see status differentiation most clearly is um, with refugee groups who are seeking um, sanctuary with other native nations in the South. So in Robbie's work, she talks a lot about how the arrival of European colonial forces that, you know, the remaking of this Mississippian world creates tons and tons of migrants. So people who sometimes flee, people who sometimes pursue different economic opportunities. And frequently you can see in the documents that um, when groups of native people come and they seek refuge with other native nations. And this is actually something that native people do very regularly. They tend to give refuge to outside groups for short periods of time, um, sometimes for longer periods of time. Sometimes these people stay and integrate, sometimes they move on. But actually the practice of sanctuary in the South is a very, very old one. But frequently when these outside groups arrive, they defer to the group who they are staying with so that they, their leaders will individually meet with outsiders. They will govern their people autonomously, but the refugee group will defer to the leadership and to the practices of the people who are there in terms of land use, in terms of thinking about, you know, the political initiatives, that sort of stuff. And with this is always the ability to pick up and move again. But yeah, I mean, it's not like everything is egalitarian across the board and there's endless potential, but there is a lot of flexibility, um, again, within this sort of transformative ideologies of the, the Mississippian and post-Mississippian South. Great, thank you. And I know for some of our listeners that may be familiar information, but but for others it might be um, might be newer. So thanks for for taking us through that. And that actually uh, addresses the the next question that came up from um, from people listening uh, about what happened to people who didn't belong. And so you've um, addressed that um, in a number of ways. And so I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, just because we have such a limited time uh, that's come in, which is how does the language we have to talk about these categories and processes reinforce a Eurocentric mode of understanding? Liz, you look like you've got... <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh man, what a, <laughs> what a question. Um, I think one of the things that I, I wrestled with a lot um, is ways of thinking about nation, because I think so often in our modern context, we think of this as meaning hard bordered exclusionary nation states, which have different logics of citizenship, subjecthood, belonging, right? These sort of, these, these very different um, ideas. And at the same time, I think one of the things that Native American and Indigenous studies demands of people who work on Native people is accountability to contemporary political context, communities, and sort of ethics of research. And because so many Native nations in this country are still fighting to be able to exercise the inherent sovereignty that comes with pre-existing the United States as nations whose homelands are currently occupied, there is also an imperative to stress in ways that are legible to a general public, the power, the sovereignty, the, nation, the nationhood of native people. And so that's something that becomes very difficult. Um, I think too, you know, using this, this language of sort of race and racial ideas of indigeneity perhaps buries us as much as it provides clarity in terms of thinking about native ways of being and belonging. It's, I mean, I think, 
I think the the basically the ideologies um, of blood either blood based citizenship and inclusion or exclusion have so saturated the premises that if I said to you something like you know I, I think it would be really great if my own native nation could provide refuge to you know migrants from across the Americas and nationalize foreign citizens most people would look at me and be like, that sounds bananas, Liz, what are you talking about? But that would be a much older practice of thinking about nationhood, inclusion and belonging. And so it's just difficult to work. I mean, I, again, I, for me, a lot of this comes back to thinking and writing about nation is really challenging because it's, I both know that it's not true. It's not an indigenous word. It's not true to the way that native people would have explained this, but as historians, right? So much of our work is translating for our current moment um, and so I think that that's something that I always um, wrestle with for sure. I don't know if my fellow panelists have other ideas about this. I would say I, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I have this, those categories have, have found them so useless. You know, they really, they, they, they do hem you in. I mean, they, they're confounding and they're, they're restricting and Trying to think outside of them is also quite difficult, though, because it's part of our construct that we work with, right? So, it's it's been a struggle. My whole career, it's been a struggle to to not feel constrained by those constructs, but yet I don't know what else to do. You know, we don't really have we haven't developed. And Miles got to this. We haven't developed the appropriate vocabulary, the, the language, the way of talking about this differently. And which is, you know, one thing that I found so interesting about my mother's work is that that seems to be the work they're doing, you know, is trying to think about this in ways that we can move outside of those constraints. Uh, I want to second, well, third now, <laughs> uh, both Liz and Ravi. Um, I, I, for me, the key is to, keep in mind and to maintain a distinction between race as a social force against which we are fighting in the present. Uh, so, I mean, I guess that would be white supremacy as a social force against we are fighting in the present, white racial capitalism <laughs> as a social force we are fighting against in the present, right? Um, and the protocols of academia. Right. And the protocols of academia are if you use a term, you must define your term. And I'm like, white supremacists aren't going well. We, since we said that race uh, is biological, we're now hemmed in by that. And so uh, we can't, you know, exempt OJ Simpson for a moment from being black. I mean, you know, that famous moment when OJ Simpson says, I'm not black, I'm OJ Simpson. And that was factually true. I mean, that is how he was treated until he wasn't, right? <laughs> um, you know, white supremacy, white racial capitalism in the world doesn't operate according to the protocols by which we get our articles approved for publication. And so as long as we maintain the distinction between those, I think that um, goes a certain way because I'm not, it's not as important to me to make sure that the way that I use race is academically legible because after all, our academic disciplines are rooted in white supremacy. So of course, what they recognize as a systematic, consistent use of race, you know, um, is actually, I think a sort of, um, long delay tactic, right? You know, it's like, well, go back and define that. Make sure you're being more systematic in the way you define that. It's like, while you go do that, <laughs> it keeps proliferating in the world. So I try to keep those things. Um, I try to, uh, that's what I was sort of saying about the ideas versus um, the actual work that race does, you know, how it regulates, how it, um, uh, how it systematizes maldistribution. You know, I mean, like that to me is the work of race is it determines who gets what, you know, who gets protection, who doesn't, you know, who gets land, who doesn't, who, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, and that's what I think we should, uh, 
yeah, try to fight. I see, I, I see Heather has unmuted. So. Yes, I've unmuted because we are, we are almost out of time already. It's flown by. So the, the final question that I'm posing that's come in, and if, if you could each give, you know, obviously a super brief uh, answer, which then in a year you'll be able to expand upon, uh, you know, at the at, at two days length, um, is how might we constructively reshape the narrative about the South? So this is, you know, thinking about, I guess, from academically, but um, to account for these complex historical engagements of natives, Black Africans, and Europeans uh, that shape the region, and then what are our next steps in this field, however you define the field that you are in. All right, I will start and I will go really fast. Um, the first one for me is we have to stop thinking of the South as defined by a black and white binary because there are indigenous people who have stayed and remained in the South. There are Latino um, folks in the South who've been there for a long time. There are Asian folks in the South. I think this just erases a whole swath of people. And I think the other thing, as I sort of mentioned in the first answer is that this continues to be indigenous homelands um, and a lot of native people remain and are rendered illegible within our imaginings of the South. So I think those are two really important shifts that we um, need to make. Again, a lot of the folks that I'm talking about having studied in the 17th and 18th century are still in Louisiana and Texas and Mississippi today. That's I was gonna say the exact same thing. Once you, more, and once you put other, South has always, has not always, but largely defined as black, white, a place, a place of black and whiteness, and it's not, and it never has been. And once we move beyond that, I think then the South becomes really, really complicated. And um, like I, I say this all the time, once you put Indians into the equation, everything changes in terms of our historical understanding. In terms of the next steps, I think it's, um, we've got a hard nut to, to crack here because we have been laboring in this field for many, many years now. And most conventional history to this day, you open them up, Indians are there, and then by the second chapter, they're gone. And that's not the case. Indians, as Liz just said, Native people are still here today and still affect and have, you know, an impact our world. And so we need to look at this in a, in a whole different way. We need to just sort of do away with that binary and start thinking about this in a very different way, including not just Native people, but as you said, Asians and, and others. Well, again, I'm going to third my colleagues. Um, I, I, I think um, that there is a sort of fantasy version of the South um, that is basically the same from, you know, 1840 to now. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I've seen, uh, for instance, uh, on Broadway, there was a, a version of A Time to Kill, you know, that was the Clancy novel that became, the, uh, what's his name, Sam Jackson movie, they turned it into a play, and I couldn't tell what time it was. You know, like I couldn't tell if it was the present or 1930 or 1870. Like I just couldn't tell. Um, and that's because of what Liz and Robbie just talked about. You know, there's this very static black white conflict, um, very static understanding of how racial terrorism works. Like it's all very static. Uh, so I think the first thing is to admit that we don't know the South and that our fantasies are blocking us. Well, Thank you all so much for that. Uh, I'm sorry we do have to uh, bring this to a close, but I'd like to take a moment to thank our scholars for their, for their brilliant insights during this conversation, uh, which will help teachers and scholars at all levels trace the intersections between race, enslavement, and indigeneity in the American South. A special thanks also goes to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their support of this series. And I'd also like to thank our audience and the lively Twitter and chat feeds to which you've contributed. We hope that many of you can join us at the Folger Institute Symposium in Tuscaloosa next spring. We at the Folger Shakespeare Library ask you for your continuing support of our work with so many audiences from K-12 educators and their students who are served by the Folger Education Division to fellowships and advanced programming for graduate students and faculty run by the Folger Institute to the award-winning productions of the Folger Theater. If you are in a position to contribute, we will be grateful. Our institution was founded on philanthropy and your philanthropy will help us continue to support groundbreaking research and share it with wider and more inclusive audiences just as we did today. We hope that you'll be able to join us on Monday, February 8th, when we'll be joined by Irvishi Chakravarti of the University of Toronto and Brandy Adams, currently of MIT and soon moving to Arizona State University 
for a session on race and the archive. Further details on this and other, com up and other upcoming critical race conversations may be found on the Folger Institute's webpage. And now I'd like to pitch things back to our panelists and give them the last word. All right, well, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to invite everybody again uh, to the Early Modern Intersections in the American South Symposium that will be held uh, in Tuscaloosa. It really is almost exactly a, a year. So we tried to choose the same weekend, on, um, the same week in the calendar. And uh, I know we didn't get to a lot of the questions that came in, but along with my co-directors, uh, Jenny Shaw and Cassie Smith, who are my colleagues here at the University of Alabama, we will be looking at those questions and drawing on them as we, as we uh, shape um, the symposium. So again, thank you to our presenters. And uh, I don't know if any, if you want to say a word of, of thanks of your own. I can say thanks everybody and hope to see you next year. Here, here, agreed. And I, I think that um, maybe the next conversation is maybe March 8th. Uh, so just for those of you who want to tune in to the next one, uh, I, I think that just double check the date. I'm not sure of the date, but I know it can't be February 8th. <laughs> My mistake, it is March 8th. Thank you very much, Miles. Always, always ready for correction from you. Thank you all so much. This is great.